Hello, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of the endocrine physiology. This is recording part three. Calcium is primarily stored in bone, about 85% of total body calcium. In fact, only 1% of your total body calcium is in the extracellular fluid. And of that, half of it is bound to albumin or other anion complexes. Only about 50% of that calcium is in its ionized, free, and biologically active form. Normal serum total calcium is about 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. Normal serum ionized calcium at my institution is reported in millimoles per liter, 1.11 to 1.3, but we can see it's about half of total serum calcium, 4.5 to 5.6 milligrams per deciliter. Patients who develop acidosis will have less protein binding and a greater amount of ionized or active calcium will be released, leading to hypercalcemia. A lot of calcium is excreted via the feces. The parathyroid hormone is secreted from the parathyroid glands, four glands located behind the thyroid gland. Patients can actually live with just one parathyroid gland. The role of parathyroid hormone is to maintain and increase serum calcium and also magnesium. This is accomplished by increasing resorption of calcium and phosphate from bone and taking it out of bone and putting it into the extracellular fluid. It also leads to increased renal calcium reabsorption and decreased renal phosphate reabsorption. Finally, parathyroid hormone will activate vitamin D, and vitamin D leads to an increase in intestinal calcium absorption and decreased renal excretion of calcium and phosphate. Calcitonin is like the opposite of parathyroid hormone. It inhibits parathyroid hormone, leading to wastage of calcium and magnesium and saving of phosphate. Just remember that calcitonin is secreted not from the parathyroid, but from the thyroid gland. And finally, vitamin D, as we said, assists in calcium absorption from the GI system. Hypoparathyroidism leads to hypocalcemia. It can occur post-surgically if all of the parathyroid glands are removed. It could occur post-thyroidectomy. In this case, the hypoparathyroidism is usually not due to losing all of the glands, but rather to disruption of the blood supply to the parathyroid glands. Transient hypoparathyroidism occurs in about 30% of thyroidectomies. Symptoms will occur 48 to 96 hours after surgery, but the parathyroid hormone levels themselves will fall very quickly because the half-life of that hormone is only two to three minutes. A serum parathyroid hormone level drawn six hours after thyroidectomy is the most reliable predictor of symptomatic hypocalcemia. Other causes of hypoparathyroidism include neck trauma, malignancy, and severe hypomagnesemia. Symptoms of hypocalcemia are usually involved with excitement of central nervous system and muscles. We see increased membrane permeability to sodium, which leads to easy initiation of action potentials. Patients will have muscle spasms, strider, seizures, tetany, or paresthesias. They may experience fatigue, congestive heart failure, hypotension, or long QT syndrome. And other causes of hypocalcemia are, in addition to decreased parathyroid hormone, decreased albumin, decreased magnesium, decreased vitamin D, renal failure, massive transfusion because the citrate binds ionized calcium, and the treatment is to reestablish calcium levels with calcium infusion, often calcium chloride or calcium gluconate. Hyperparathyroidism leads to hypercalcemia. Primary hyperparathyroidism is due to parathyroid hormone secreting adenomas, parathyroid gland hyperplasia, or other tumors. 
Secondary hyperparathyroidism would be increased PTH due to hypocalcemia or hyperphosphatemia. Renal disease can lead to a vitamin D deficiency, which can also elevate parathyroid hormone levels. Symptoms of hypercalcemia are related to depression of the CNS and muscle activity. We may see kidney stones or nephrolithiasis, as well as polyuria, polydipsia, weakness, fatigue, and depression. Hypertension, short QT syndrome, heart block, bradycardia, peptic ulcer disease. And causes of hypercalcemia, besides increased PTH, are commonly malignancy. Treatment of hypercalcemia includes IV fluids and Lasix to help get rid of calcium. Bisphosphonates can chelate the extra calcium. Calcitonin can be used to offset the action of parathyroid hormone, and dialysis may be needed in some extreme cases. We've been talking a lot about phosphate, incidentally. Phosphate levels in the blood are measured as serum phosphorus which accounts for all different sources of phosphorus. Normal serum phosphorus is 2.5 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. Hyper and hypophosphatemia were discussed earlier in the semester. Now we'll move on to the adrenal gland, and specifically the adrenal cortex, which is the outer part of the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland secretes glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and androgenic or sex hormones. Aldosterone, which we've discussed many times, is a mineralocorticoid. We've been through the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone pathway over and over again. We know that angiotensin II and serum potassium both stimulate aldosterone secretion from the adrenal cortex. And we know that aldosterone's action is to cause save sodium and P potassium. Primary hyperaldosteronism, or Kahn's syndrome, will lead to hypertension, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, weakness, and fatigue. These patients may lose enough potassium to have total body deficits greater than 300 milliequivalents. On the other hand, hypoaldosteronism will present as hyperkalemia, sodium and chloride loss, hypovolemia, hypotension, metabolic acidosis, and in the extreme can lead to death. These patients should be treated with a mineralocorticoid such as fludrocortisone. So that was mineralocorticoids. Now we focus on glucocorticoids like cortisol. The hypothalamus secretes CRF, cortisol-releasing factor, which goes to the anterior pituitary and stimulates release of ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. That goes to the adrenal cortex and causes secretion of cortisol. There is then negative feedback where cortisol inhibits further release of ACTH and CRF. In a normal day, the body secretes about 20 milligrams of cortisol, but in cases of stress, as much as 150 to 300 milligrams can be secreted. When patients are given exogenous steroids as a medication, this also causes negative feedback in the cortisol axis, and this can lead to adrenal insufficiency, where the adrenal gland can no longer secrete adequate steroid in response to stress, and this is called an Addisonian crisis. Cortisol will increase blood glucose, it's catabolic, anti-inflammatory, and anti-immune. Cortisol allows the system to resist physical and mental stress, injury, and illness. Cushing syndrome occurs when patients have elevated cortisol levels. It presents as edema, volume overload, weight gain, hypertension, and hyperglycemia. Patients may have classic signs of truncal obesity, buffalo hump behind the neck, abdominal striae, 
moon facies, osteopenia, and tissue paper skin. Patients may experience emotional changes, not different from what we hear in the media as roid rage or steroid rage. Patients may also experience immunosuppression, peptic ulcer disease, and cataracts. In the anesthesia setting, we need to be careful with these patients to manage their hypertension and blood glucose carefully, monitor their volume status, and remember that their skin and bones may be delicate. The discussion of Addisonian crisis is covered in lots of detail in the pharmacology curriculum. That's it for this session. Please let me know if you have questions about any of the material.